Good morning. And welcome to worship at St. Giles. We're glad that you are with us, whether you are here in person or virtually. If you're here in person, we'd be glad for you to sign the friendship register and pass it down the pews. If you're worshiping with us virtually, we'd be glad for you to send us a note or leave a message in the chat today. I'm really glad to welcome one of my Presbyterian friends here today with us from South Africa, courtesy of New Jersey. And um, his name is Peter Nanwa, and Peter is going to sing with me later in the service. Peter is someone I met in some of the connectional work with the hymnal, and he's here to go to the Montreat Worship and Music Conference this week. So we're just lucky enough to be neighbors and get to celebrate his talents today. Another special new guest we have in worship today are these beautiful new pyramids that are both on the pulpit, lectern, and table. These pyramids are almost identical to the pyramids that have been in the sanctuary for years and years made by Laura Burroughs. Um, these pyramids were made over the winter and spring by Sandy Runberg and Debbie Rogers. They happened to order this beautiful green fabric from Ukraine, and it happened to ship just before the war started. So that's a wonderful connection for us to have and keep in mind as we pray together, but also to, um, to lift up the history of all those who have loved St. Giles and enabled our worship together from Laura Burroughs into the present. So we're really grateful for these new gifts. Next Sunday, we will be sending a group of youth um, and some adult leaders down to Thornwell for a mission trip experience down there where we will partner with our friends and family down in Thornwell to learn about what they are up to, to participate in some of their uh, work and ministry there, and also hopefully build connections and grow ourselves. So if you would like to send a note of encouragement, of support to some of the youth or leaders who are going, that would be so welcomed and well received. If you want more information, so you can write those by name to people who are going, please talk to me or to uh, Tim Ellis, and we will help you get information that you would need to write those cards. You can just drop them off at church, and we'll make sure that our youth or leaders get those. Then, if you're not going to Thornwell that day, there's a game night that evening, and more information about all of that is found in um, this handy announcement sheet that's in your bulletin, or you can find it online. With all of that in mind, we want to make sure that you are welcomed to worship. So take a moment and notice the space you're in. Take a moment and give thanks for the gift of this day, and breathe a deep breath in, and then breathe it out. Breathe in and notice how you breathe the same air that the breath of God spoke through and moved at the beginning of creation. Breathe out and share words of shalom, words of peace with the world around you, letting that breath cleanse your body and your thoughts as you let go and prepare for all that is, all that was, and all that will be as we gather for worship together this day.
Please rise in body or in spirit. The waters of baptism wash away all labels. In Christ, we are all children of God. The rains fall as blessings upon all God's children. We each reflect the image of God. Here, our differences unite us. For the rainbow cannot exist without every color, and the body is made of many parts. Let us sing and worship God who binds us together as one family. as we continue our worship with a time of confession. We come to the font like those in the wilderness crying out for healing, for help, for recognition. Here in the waters of life, in the waters of baptism, we see that we are one, that we are whole, that we are washed clean, forgiven, and able to live again. So come to the font, not proud or ashamed, but honest, that we might live into the idea, the calling that God gives us to be healers. Come and let us confess our sins. Lord, whenever you encountered a person in need, you focused on their wellness you call us to participate in the healing that builds your kingdom. You empower us to banish legions of demons and remove afflictions that cause harm. Help us help ourselves and heal others. Forgive us, for we have lost our way. Instead of healing, first we triage. We judge whether or not we believe someone is worthy of healing. We sin by believing that our opinion is your opinion. In our assessment, we fail to heal. We lose the opportunity to live into our calling, and we sin. Forgive my countless and endless judgments. 
Forgive my looking away instead of running toward. Forgive my crossed arms of scorn. Soften the sharp edges of my heart and open my arms with compassion. Forgive me and remind me of the work I am called to do, to love and heal all of your children who are my siblings in Christ. Sisters and brothers, do not let the burdens of sin bow you down and destroy you. Rise in body or in spirit. Rise in body or in spirit. And listen to grace, mercy, and love which never end. Be healed in the waters of life. For in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we turn to God's word, let us turn to God in prayer. Holy One, Holy Three, you alone are the breath of life. You alone have the living word. You spoke life into being just with your word. And then that word came to life among us in Jesus Christ. That life came among us and healed us and transformed us and called us into life eternal with you. We pray that as we turn to the reading of your word today, we would see glimmers of your living word, your holy breath, and be transformed by who you are within us, around us, before us, and behind us today. Amen. The first lesson today is from the book of Galatians in the third chapter, beginning in the 23rd verse. Listen now for the word of God to the people of God. Before faith came, we were guarded under the law, locked up until faith that was coming would be revealed, so that the law became our custodian until Christ, so that we might be made righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. You are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, there, nor there is male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. This ends the first reading. Now let me invite any children who are here to come forward for a moment, and you're welcome to bring offerings for the Thornwell Building Families program today. Hi, Everett. Sit here.
So I know that earlier this year, Hannah had a hurt foot, didn't you? And you had it wrapped up. I'm going to wrap up your foot again here for just a second. When you had a hurt foot, was it very easy for you to walk around with that big old boot? Oh, yeah? You're, you're stronger than you thought. Oh, her sister says, I had to help you. Yeah, so it, it's sort of hard because um, when you wrap up your foot in a bandage or you have to wear a big boot, can you move it the same way you normally do? Not really. And when you walk, you have to sort of drag it around behind you, right? It sort of clunks. It's heavier than your normal body. What about, um, I'm sure that everybody here has had to wear a Band-Aid at some point, right? When you have a Band-Aid, why is it that you get the Band-Aid? That you're hurt. Because you're hurt. And what does the Band-Aid do? Hmm? Okay, it does protect you, yeah. So does the Band-Aid make it stop bleeding? Not or no, not, exactly. not exactly. It sort of keeps the blood, keeps you clean, and it might keep medicine on whatever you, um, you've hurt so that it takes care of it. Um, we talk about Jesus being a healer and that all of us need healing, but how many people today feel hurt. Do you have a band-aid on right now? Is anybody bleeding? No. Do you feel like you need healing right now? No. <laughs> but when we talk about Jesus being the healer, we're thinking about how Jesus heals us in all the ways. So have you ever had a hurt heart? Does anybody here, um, did anybody come to church feeling sad today? Was anybody angry today? You actually don't have to raise your hands on that one. But um, that we talk about the ways that Jesus heals us in all the ways. That Jesus heals us in our head and in our heart and on our body. And that when Jesus heals us, then we can run around and play and do all the things that we're meant to do but we can't do when we're hurt. And so whether that's hurt in your heart and you're freed to be joyful and happy or whether you're hurt in your head and you're freed to wake up and see things as God sees or you're hurt in your body and you can't do all the things you'd like to, Jesus heals us. And so we say thank you to God for being our healer and I'm going to let you guys keep those band-aids today to remember that um, Jesus wants to take care of you when you're hurt. So let's say a prayer together before you guys go. If you'll put your hands together and close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for healing me and helping me when I'm hurt. Please help me to heal others and to help others when I can. Amen. Have a great day. You want to keep it? You want to give it back to me? You want me to take it? Okay. No, oh, thank you. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. So listen as the Spirit speaks, Jesus heals, and truth is revealed. Jesus and his disciples sailed to the Gerasenes land, which, as I'm sure you know, is across the lake from Galilee. And as soon as Jesus got out of the boat, a certain man met him. The man was from the city and was possessed by demons. For a long time, he lived among the tombs. He was naked and he was homeless. When he saw Jesus, he shrieked, <laughs> And he fell down before Jesus. 
And then he shouted, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torture me. Now he said this because Jesus had already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had already taken possession of him, so he would be bound with leg irons and chains and placed under armed guard. But he would... Legion, he replied, because many demons had entered him. They pleaded with him not to order him back into the... ordered them to go back out into the abyss. And a large herd of pigs was feeding on a hillside, and the demons begged Jesus, they begged him to let them go from the man into the pigs. So Jesus gave them his permission, and the demons left the man, and they entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the cliff into the lake where they all drowned. When those who tended the pigs saw what happened, they ran away, and they told this story in the city and in the countryside. Wherever they were, they told the story. People came to see what had happened. They came to find Jesus, and they found the man whom the demons had gone away from, and he was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully dressed, completely sane. They were filled with awe. Those people who had actually seen what happened told them how the demon-possessed man had been delivered. Then everyone gathered from the region of the Gerasenes and asked Jesus to leave their area because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and he returned across the lake. The man from whom the demons had gone begged to come along with Jesus as one of his disciples. But Jesus sent him away and he said, return home. Go and tell the story of what God has done for you. And so he went throughout the city, proclaiming what Jesus had done and what God had done for him. This is the word of God. God. Last week, I concluded the the service by talking about how I had run on a leg that was breaking until that leg was millimeters away from shattering a femur and causing me to have a full hip replacement. I was in pain, and I did not want anybody to know that pain. I was hurting, but I didn't want to be anything other than okay. When I was in second grade, a friend of my brother's traveled with us to a bonfire and found a can of Aquanet hairspray. I don't know if you remember this, it was like a pink can with like fishnet stockings on the outside and it's how everybody in the 80s got their hair like so amazing. (laughs) You could create works of art with that can. Turns out you could also destroy someone's life forever with a can of hairspray. My friend took this can and tossed it into the fire. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. Maybe we should leave. And he held me and he said, no, my dad's a firefighter. I know what's okay and what's not. I was in second grade. And my world changed forever when that fire transformed into an explosion and the bottom of the can flew out, struck me on the left cheek and began to burn my face off while sliding down, at which point I lifted my hand, pulled a piece of my face off, screamed in terror while looking at what had happened to me, tried to shake it off, but now my hand was on fire, so I had to take my other hand and remove that and burn both hands and a significant portion of my face in the process. While screaming, my hero, my father, came out of the woods and scooped me up. He flew me to the hospital or the emergency room, I don't know, wherever we went. And people proceeded to cut pieces of things off of me and replace them with bandages and salves and balms and put all sorts of 
horribly painful things on me in order to promote healing. Everybody did the very best they could do. And you might look at me and be like, you don't look like you suffered a pretty severe burn when you were a kid. It's because people did a really good job at taking care of me immediately, triaging me appropriately, doing the work of healing that was necessary. My physical wounds are very minimal, if at all. What was not really well treated, though, were the psychic and spiritual wounds that also occurred. Spiritually, I never understood that people could die and that I could be one of those people. That severe injury could happen and it could change my life. I didn't know how to deal with what it was to go back with a huge difference on my face to second grade, where kids are not always nice. I had nightmares for a long time, from second grade till college, actually, where I would be dreaming, and I would be in bed, and the house would light on fire, and I would wake up, and I would watch my right hand and then my left catch fire, and the firefighters would come, and somehow the house would get bigger, and they would turn into clowns, and they would stand on their ladders, and they would watch, and they would laugh, and I would burn to death in my dreams, and I died on a regular basis. I had an uncle or a, a relative who wanted to be helpful, and so he would throw firecrackers, and they would explode nearby with the sense that maybe this would desensitize me from the fear and trauma that I would carry that these explosions might just become normal and I would stop worrying about the pain or the suffering. The 4th of July was a day of absolute terror. I would run away, I would hide, I would get in a fetal position in a closet and I would just rock and try not to hear or to see everything that had happened before and wonder at all if this day would ever come to an end. It was terrible. Everybody wanted me to be okay. I desperately wanted to be okay, but I wasn't. So I hid it, and I tried to bury it, and I tried to be that person who was strong and the kid that everybody wanted me to be. But I couldn't quite get there. I couldn't light a match without having flashbacks. I couldn't encounter fire or flames or even like see scenes in movies where there was explosions without having things trigger that were just traumatic. And I lived with this for years until I got to college when one of my professors started talking about PT at PTSD and was like, so this is a thing and this happens and uh, I was like, oh, I have so many of those symptoms. And he was like, no, you probably don't. Like, this is something that happens to people mostly in, like, wars or with, like, severe trauma or tragedy. And I was like, no, like, something happened to me when I was little. And he then did this thing where he said, great. And I said, no, it's not great. It's bad. And he said, no, this is great because I know somebody who does great work. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to cover the cost of your therapy, and you're going, to, you're going to work on this. And if you're not better by the end of the semester, I'm going to fail you in my class. And I said, what? Like, what are you talking about? That would be devastating to me. And he's like, I know. And that's why it's going to work. And so I had to go to this therapist. And they taught me how to dream differently. And they gave me the tools to heal through all this pain that I had carried for so long. And it was like somebody handed me a miracle and said, you can have a different life and have it back. I do not hold a grudge against anybody in that story. I think people were really doing the best they could with what they had. I don't think they saw the pain that I carried because I think I was pretty good and not always waking up screaming at night or telling people about my dreams or telling people about the fear and trauma that I carried because I just wanted to be normal. 
I know what it is to have a demon and to have their name be legion. Because that's one of many traumas that has impacted me and my lifetime. I also know what it is to be a pastor and to be blessed with a congregation because each and every one of you carry your own legion. We are blessed in the work that we do because the most important thing any of us collectively as Christians can do is the work of healing. I think people get this totally confused way too often and to no end when they think the point of the pastor, the point of the Christian is somehow righteousness or purity. Baptize people in my names, cast out demons, bring healing. When you look at the stories in the Acts, The stories that we continue to tell, they are stories of healing, of miracles brought by people coming to other people, sensing their pain, finding their demons, and sending them away in order that love can be experienced. We are working on growth and being in a season of growth together. That cannot happen when pain remains unaddressed. Today is Juneteenth. It is the day which we as a nation celebrate and honor the end of slavery. This became a national holiday only a few years ago. My pain was buried and denied personally for a few years. The pain of slavery has been buried and denied for centuries. If we as a nation are going to heal and move forward, we must talk about the sins of our past because we carry the pain and bearing it does not make it go away. It creates trauma, it brings demons, it creates space for violence, which we simply do not have time for anymore. Ours is the work of healing. When we read the scriptures today and we hear in Galatians that there is no longer Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free, nor male, nor female, but we are one in Christ, we have to take that seriously. When we encounter scriptures where someone is screaming and screeching and causing all manner of ruckus because their pain is real, we have to do the work of healing before anything else can happen. When we are getting ready to go out on a date and one of our children falls and they skin their knee, we are going to be late for our reservation because it is more important to heal them than it is to just move on because we have a schedule. I love my dad, and I think he's a great father, mostly because he was not the walk-it-off kind of dad. He would stop and pay attention. He still to this day does this really annoying thing where he'll talk about emotions with me and make me think through things that I didn't do as well as I potentially could have done and find ways to be a better human in the world. It's annoying and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. I don't think masculinity looks like being the strongest. I don't believe it is being the most powerful. I don't believe it is having the greatest weapons. But I think when we come to Father's Day and Juneteenth and they're the same day and it's a celebration and then the scriptures are also pointing to this beautiful work of healing, we bear witness to the truth of God our Father who calls us into the realms of love, compassion, and mercy. I tell you, I was not free as a child because I struggled all the time. When somebody came and said, this does not have to be your forever life, there is healing available. It was like the world was made new. And again, I share that story with you because I believe and I know each and every one of us carries stories of pain of trauma, of suffering. Dr. King will say, darkness does not chase out darkness. 
The stars shine at night because they are light in the darkness. And if you want to confront the evils of the world, you can never do that with greater evil or darkness. Violence cannot be the answer to violence. Only nonviolence can do that. Only peace brings light. Only love brings healing. We know these things to be true, and yet it's so easy to do that other thing, to push people away, to pretend we're okay. So friends, brothers and sisters, be courageous in the call. Receive the gift, hear the truth. The church is not a Kevin Costner movie, a field of dreams. It is not a place where if we build it, people come. The church really is much more like the AA meeting, where when people are healed, they go out and they tell other people, come and see this thing that happened. Just like the man with the demon was, said, Jesus, I just want to be one of your disciples and stay with you forever. And Jesus said, no. Go out and tell the world what happened to you. Go and tell them of the healing, and then the world will be changed because they will come and need to experience that. We as a church must heal. Ourselves, our community, our world. And then when we do that work of healing, we send people out and we say, come and see this good place where I was suffering and I was made whole. And now new worlds are available. Now I see God everywhere because somebody was love to me. It is like a balm that heals all wounds and gives us the opportunity to see resurrection and life abundant. It doesn't have to be the other way. And so we are called into the work of healing, into the place where we are the balm the world needs, where our heart wounds are healed and we bear each other's pain with hope and gladness. So let us grow and let us be the balm as we continue to share God's love with ourselves and the world this day and forevermore. Six. 
No, I lost my place. You guys are going to have to stand back up again. I'm sorry. (laughs) The reason we stand up when we're affirming our faith, the reason we stand up when we sing the glory of poetry, we are giving honor to God. We are making a statement. We are putting our body and our weight into what we say we believe, that God is glorious and God is good. So using words from Scripture, from the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Matthew, Christians, what do you believe? I believe that Jesus commanded us to love each other. The Scriptures proclaim, Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. I believe the greatest commandment is to love, to love the Lord our God with all my heart, with all my being, and with all my mind. The second greatest commandment is to love my neighbor as myself. When we embrace the call to love, we grow in faith and understanding until the blessed day when each child of God is fully seen, fully known, and fully loved. Now, you may be seated. Let us lift up our prayers, our hearts together to God in prayer. God, you are glorious. And it's easy to imagine and see and feel your glory when days are beautiful like this. Crisp and clear and new bright with colors, teeming with life. You are amazing, God. Present in each small way, in each breath we each take, in each wiggle of each toe we each do, present in each tiny ant that's scurrying across the sidewalk outside and in the call of each hawk. You have made this beautiful, diverse world full of so many colors and textures and differences, and yet you have called us to be one, one family, through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we say thank you that we would be included in that invitation. Thank you that we would be called your family. Thank you that you've given us a specific church home at St. Giles to be family together. Thank you for friends and family members who wrap us up in their arms when we are hurt. Thank you for good doctors and good medicine that help us. Thank you, all God, for all of the blessings of this day. Thank you for the call to discipleship. We could go on. We could find more ways to say thank you, more ways to say praise. And yet, the brokenness within ourselves, the brokenness within our families, the brokenness of the world weighs heavily on us. And so we feel as though we may have a longer list of things that need your attention today. We pray for those who are in need of healing in body, mind, and spirit. We pray for those who feel just covered up and drowning by a legion of evil forces that prevent them from living in the fullness of who you called them to be, but leave them dislocated, isolated from community. Help us to see them with your eyes, full of grace and mercy, 
and love. Help us to tend to them with your hands, full of kindness and gentleness. Let us be the healing in the world, and if we cannot be the healing in the world, let us testify to the healing in the world and accompany one another as we go in search of help. Guide our feet that we would follow your path, which leads only to healing and life. Hear us now as we lift up in silence the needs that we bring to you today in our heart. So we pray for ourselves, for those we know, for those we do not know but whose situations we are ever mindful of, and ask that your Holy Spirit would intercede with sighs too deep for words, carrying the brokenness of this world into the very center of your heart. Heal us. Be the balm that you have promised. And then let us testify to the good news you've given us. Good news that we heard from Paul. Good news that we heard from Peter. And perhaps today, good news that we will tell someone else. Bind all of these prayers together in the one prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Even broken, even wounded, we have gifts to offer. Gifts that the church needs, gifts that God doesn't need but is honored by. So today, and as we go through this week, um, be thoughtful about the ways that you can give back to God in time, talents, and treasure, offering a kind word, serving the community, making financial sacrifices in order that we could pursue the mission and ministry that God has called us to do together.
Gracious Father, we give thanks for the gifts that you have given us with, for the moments of each day, for the chance to heal and find new life. Transform these gifts as you continue to transform our lives so that the world might see your love constantly being poured out and that we might be your healers and servants. Amen. What does the Lord require of us? To, to do justice, justice to, to love, love kindness, kindness, and, and walk, walk humbly, humbly with, with our God. God. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Sisters and brothers, your charge is to find a Band-Aid and carry it with you where you go, so that you might be reminded that you are called to be a healer, that you might heal the wounds in your own heart, and when you're not okay, say, I need help. I'm not okay right now. I need help. It is okay to not be okay. And we are in this together to help heal and bear those burdens together. And when you're okay, go and find people who need that healing. Be like Jesus wandering into those spaces, hearing the cries and stopping the agenda to do the work of necessary healing in the moment. Do this and we will transform the world, we will grow the church, we will be the builders of this kingdom which we all dream for. So go into the world that the Father has made and blessed and called you to be a part of. Go with the love of Christ, embracing the interruptions of the disruptive that you might have the opportunity to heal and go with the power of the Spirit, knowing you have all you need to do that work of healing. Be love that the world might see God everywhere. 
this day and forever. Amen. Does not wisdom call, understanding raise a voice, bidding us to work for justice, justice and love? Does not wisdom call, understanding